She learned on that flight that no, hell no, he was serious, he's dead serious. And so on the way back to try to curb it, um, we had stopped the night before. We were at, it was sort of like you know our vacation, so we had a bottle of wine and stuff. We didn't finish uh, one of them. We couldn't take it on the flight with us, and I, I didn't want to just pour a bottle of Lambrusco down the damn drain. So, and I needed to numb myself in the flight, so I poured it into a sixty, you know, four ounce, uh, you know, drink. And while we were going through TSA, I'm drinking it the whole time. By the time I got on that plane, I was so sloshed. But it didn't help. I was still like dealing with turbulence. You know, I was like, "Damn it!" You were just freaking out, drunk and freaking out. Yeah, I was almost embalmed by the time I got on that flight. It was like it was a long wait, TSA. But at the same time, it wasn't long enough because I had to like drink that stuff really fast, and it was just going straight through my head. Like, Holy shit! That also, I guess, explains you know what kind of cheap bastard I am. You know, it's like just throw the damn bottle away. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I paid for this one. That's right. That cost me thirty-two dollars. I ain't throwing that away. I'm Scottish. We swear and we're cheap. It's just the way it is. With uh oh, okay. So it's is it actually past two already, or is it? Does everybody have that time? I didn't want to get started too early. Uh, it is 14.03. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Well, thanks for coming to the panel. We're done. <laughs> so, uh, I was talking last night at my uh, WTF uh, panel about what it's like to be on a reality show. And I always ask before I start talking about, uh, like, look, if anyone has ever had aspirations of being on a reality show. Does anybody, right? You guys are the smart ones, okay? Because, uh, and, and, and this gentleman will probably, you know, uh, at least attest to the, the insanity that I ran through on just a couple of episodes in this show. Did anyone, before, I, yeah, I guess I should probably ask, have you seen the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge on Sci Fi? No? It's quite not really as fun, you know? But, so, have you watched Face Off? Oh, oh you guys are pricks. No! <laughs> So, Face Off is, is uh, the Jim Henson show is just like Face Off, only better, because I was on it. Um, because they have three days to do a makeup, right? Right, to sculpt it, mold it, and then apply the makeup the next day, right? We had the exact same situation. It was three days to sculpt, build, things like that, but we were building animatronic creatures that had to be film ready in three days or less. Some of those competitions were two days. So you had to have animatronics, you had to have costuming. Because a lot of people don't know, when you're watching Face Off, there's a, co there's a costume department that's actually putting their costumes together. Um, they don't run their own foam, so essentially they're just sculpting and molding, and then someone else, while they're sleeping, is casting things like foam and things like that. For us, we were doing all the foam fabrication ourselves, we were doing, um, any costume design ourselves, we had to, in some cases, completely encase uh, one actor, and in some cases, two actors in one suit, in one creature suit. That suit had to be animatronic, it had to have a gimmick, had to be original, and had to be flawless, really, because the judges that were judging us were uh, special effects masters or um, producers. Uh, you know, films. So we had to produce, uh, sorry, impress these guys. It went back a couple of rows. I mean, but so um, so it was a really intense show, and there was a lot of stuff behind the scenes that kind of uh, you know drove us a little buggy, you know, um, about the process. And it was mainly because a lot of us had never been on a reality show before. Um, and we weren't quite sh sure what the setup was going to be, you know, and it did feel like a setup. But I talk about this in the book. So the, the, the panel's based on, on the book I wrote, which is in, uh, we've got in development right now, a comic book based on the book and um, an animated TV series coming out. So um, hopefully you guys will see one of those. Not stop watching Face Off because, no, I actually love those guys. <laughs> Yeah, we're on the same network. It's like a brotherhood. So we're, yeah, they're not bad. They're just not as cool as we are. Um, so we, we, you know, um, so I, I put in the book all the crazy stuff that you guys might 
think some crazy stuff is going on behind the scenes, but you really have no idea. Like some of the things, some of the, the ways that you're treated. Like, and I was mentioning last night how we were left in a room for like, you know, hours upon hours because they had forgotten we were there. You know, I mean, you meant so little to this production that um, uh, there was an episode we did. You guys are familiar with the Dark Crystal, right? From the, from the 80s? Well, the Henson Company actually produced that project and they worked on all the creatures, right? So we did a Dark Crystal themed episode and we got to create a Skeksis of our own, right? Um, and at the very end, you get to see this picture. It's, I wish we had a dry erase board. We had this beautiful picture of, a, of, a, of the dark crystal. It was hanging there from the, from the original movie, right? Um, and the set, it was just an amazing set. And then there's this beautiful photo of everyone in the production was just right there for this photo. Everyone but us. So we were the cast. We were the people whose faces were on the show. And we weren't even worthy of that photo. So our handlers asked you know, hey, listen, can we get a photo with these guys in front of the Dark Crystal? It's sort of like their childhood things. And they finally allowed us back in the building to take a picture. But we weren't worth turning on the lights. So they had to use a cell phone, not a big camera. So it's a cell phone. It's the grainiest picture I've ever seen. And you can barely make out who we are standing next to the Dark Crystal. So that's the kind of thing that you're going to, when you walk into a reality show, that they don't tell you about. Because the lead up, is how exciting it's gonna be and how important you are to the show and how great you are and just how just how much they love you. I hate that, I swear to God. Because everything in Hollywood's love, you mean it, and it's like, <laughs> just, it's, it's sort of like you just wanna sucker punch them in a few times because you know it's the complete opposite of what they're saying. But this is the Hollywood way of saying, you know, you know you're just gonna have to deal with it. So I mean, there's all that stuff that you have to deal with. Um, and, and I put in the book enough stuff that I'm pretty sure we're gonna be soon. Like, um, I'm like, yeah. Like, my publisher is sort of looking forward to it from a marketing standpoint, but I'm, I'm a little terrified, you know? But I was like, there are some of the things um, I talk about are not so much the contestants for the most part. Um, there's, a li there's, there's actually quite a bit about the contestants, but it was mainly about how the production treats, you know, the people, you know, on the show. Um, I, I wish I could say that it was more fun than it was it, but the stress levels, you know, were just so intense. And people think, oh, well, maybe it wasn't actually in third, you know, in three days. Like maybe they didn't have to build a creature in three days. And you're right. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, suggestion that we worked for three days, but we only worked ten hours a day for three days. So we didn't have full you know, three days. We had thirty hours. And we would have given up sleep, we would have given up food to be able to do a better job on our creatures, but they cut us off at a certain spot. So when they said we had three days, in reality, we had 30 hours. Um, and you'd think that for 10 hours a day, that's a lot of work. But what they were doing is they were pulling you out of your work to do these, um, those, those, those confessional things, right? which suck because it takes half an hour or more to do it. You have to walk over there. It takes you like 15 minutes because no one thought, maybe we should put the confessional right next to the set so that we're just sort of pulling them off to the side and we could just do it right there. <laughs> no, so you had to walk like this 10 minute walk across the, um, the Creature Shop parking lot into a trailer that half the time didn't have AC. And it's got the LA sun just beating on it. And then some dipshit decided, well, let's, let's just stick this under the Burbank airport. So right in the middle, you finally get something out and you had to hold for a damn airplane. You know, so now you had you lose your train of thought, you're trying to get back into the in, into mode. And it's, it's harder than you think because there's one thing that, I mean, pay attention the next time you're watching a reality show. We have to speak in present tense, no one speaks in the present tense because that's not how life works when something has happened to you it's happened to you moments ago it's now in the past so a lot of the times when we're speaking to each other we're talking about things that have happened just a moment ago oh my god it was so funny no 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 it's not oh my god it was so funny it's oh my god this is so funny you know it's already happened but you have to talk like it's happening in the now and it's harder than you think and so you'll say something you know we need present tense 
and you're trying to have a reason, you'll say it again, but your brain jiggles a little bit, and then all of a sudden you start to like fumble over words, and you finally get the damn thing out, oh, we got to hold for an aircraft. Son of a, you know, it's, it's frustrating as hell. You wouldn't think it would be, but when you've got to say the same line four times, you know, if it was funny the first time, it's certainly not funny after that, you know? And they would do that with everything. I told a joke in one of the episodes, and everyone is just roaring. Um, and you guys would get this, because you're into creatures, right? You're into animals. Well, we did this one episode, it was episode four, where we had to create, um, a, 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 you know, a, a sort of a mythical animal, but they had um, taxidermy busts that we had to sculpt on. So there was like a deer, there was a badger, there was a bear, you know, I had a bull, right? And this other kid and I were making really bad jokes, right? Like, I'd be like, you know, this is bullshit while well, I'm actually sculpting on a bull and people would just start laughing. Or Jake would be like, that was barely funny because he had the bear and it was just really bad dad jokes. But there was the only thing we had to keep us, you know, laughing and stuff. And, you know, and one guy was like really good at uh, um, his Christopher Walken impressions. And so they were cracking us up. These were the only way we would try to stay in a good mood. Um, and so I said something about, um, I, I, I know it was, some, it, it, was, it was just a small joke, but I told the joke and everyone is just erupting. And then all of a sudden we get cued from the producer on set, or no, from the first AD. She's like, hey, we need to do that again. We're gonna move the cameras around. We want you to tell the joke again. I'm like, okay. So I tried to be, you know, spontaneous. I'm like, hey guys, blah, blah, blah. Now there's only like half the laughter. It's like, shit. And they're like, okay, we're gonna move the cameras over here. We need you to do it again. Again, seriously, you know? I tell the joke again, I'm trying to be enthusiastic and no one's laughing and there's like crickets now. And I'm like, son of a bitch, that's the take they're gonna use for the show. I knew for a fact at that moment that that was the take they were gonna Luckily that didn't happen. I don't know how I ended up getting, you know, um, you know, I gotta be honest, I was represented a lot better than I thought I was going to be because I think I was hired as the show's asshole, right? Um, meaning, they, if, you, if you watch a reality show, there's always the sweet one. There's always, you know, the, the one that's like the fashion victim. There's always the one that's, you know, um, kind of bitchy and moody, and then there's the, the jerk and stuff. And I thought, just the way I look, the fact that I'm ex-military, all these things were playing in, oh my God, I'm the jerk, right? I, I was like, I, I knew for a fact, but when I watched them play it back, it wasn't so bad. And I'll let you in on a little bit of a secret in the first book, because if you watch the show, you would have seen most of it, but you don't get to see the behind the scenes stuff where they had actually put me in with this woman, her name was Tina. She was socially awkward, and it, I finally could not be pleasant any longer and blew up at Tina, and then by the end of the episode, she was crying in front of the judges. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to hell for this. I'm gonna go to a uh, reality show hell for this because I thought for sure that all the people watching the show was gonna, were gonna crucify me. It turns out that that's not the way they went because I guess the way they edited it, you know, Tina looked worse. It was a little more, it was a little more true to form because Tina was a little bit of a pain. She was not an asshole. She was a really sweet person. She just couldn't work well with other people. And that was sort of like the frustration of the whole thing. But, you know, they edited it to be a little more true to life and I was somehow spared the, the harassment that she received online, you know, and it was really bad. And that's something else they don't tell you about. Like fans are evil. I mean, like some of those fans want to see you crash and burn, you know, and the fans really went after Tina in a, in a venomous way. And we, none of us were really prepared for that. They tell us, don't read the message boards. Don't read the message boards on IMDb. Don't read them on Facebook. Don't read them on Twitter. Ignore your social media for the next little while. But is anyone here going to try to do that? I mean, think about it. Put it yourself in that place. Could you avoid that? I couldn't. I had to go look. And when I looked, I was pissed half the time. And my wife's like, stop looking. But she's looking on her phone. She's just not telling me about it. 
you know? And she's going to my defense. The worst thing you can do when you're dealing with trolls is to go to someone's defense. Because they don't even care about what they're talking about. They just want to be venomous for the sake of venom. And now you're the subject, and now all of a sudden your wife is caught up in it. And while I'm perfectly capable and happy at shooting people in the face, I can't really find every one of these people and do this. Because I would have made a serial murdering career out of hunting some of these people down. Not for what they said about me, but definitely attacking my wife. I mean, but that's the kind of stuff that you deal with that you don't know about. And there's a lot of that in the book. I mean, I just kind of gave you like just a little bit of a chapter there. Um, but there's good stuff too. You know, I mean, like I was telling them last night about coming in to cons and doing things like that. But there's things that people don't understand that you have to work just as hard after coming off a reality show to get gigs than you did if you were just like like a regular person who who knew the same things, you know, who was still good at their job and stuff, and still artistically talented, and had no connection to Hollywood, you're going to work almost as hard, if not harder, than those people because you're really not given anything. You you would think, right, that the people coming off Face Off and coming off the Henson Show had a national platform, but the network doesn't work that way. Once you're off the show, they don't give a damn about you anymore. And so you're, you're sort of left to your own devices. Now you've got all this attention, but you don't know how to focus it. And a lot of people crash and burn because of it. Because they come off these shows and were promised this. They're not supposed to promise this, but they promise this. When you guys come off the show, you're going to be so famous, you're not going to know what to do with it. But that's not the case. If, you're not, if you don't start working on, you know, your appearance package, you know, your, your uh, public relations uh, department, if you don't start working on that before you go on the show, you're kind of behind the eight ball and you're screwed, you know? Because like, I was, I was sort of ahead of the game. I came up with a gimmick before I went on the show. I came up with a means to, um, you know, uh, to, uh, sorry, to, uh, to market myself to, you know, to Comic Cons and things like that. I was prepared for that before I went in but I should have been preparing much further back, you know, and even that I was behind. So a lot of the guys from the show will call me and they'll be like, hey, can you get me into a Comic-Con? And some of them are like, hell no. Do you not remember that I can't stand you? You know, <laughs> I mean, so no, I can't. But I'm like my friends, like Lex and Yvonne, you know, um, they do cons, but you know, I do way more. Like I was telling uh, them last night, this is my 46th Comic-Con in three years. So I do a lot of get you know celebrity appearances, and but it takes a lot of work. I'm up until four before I got my agent. I was up until four o'clock in the morning, just putting feelers out to comic cons, trying to get people to to pay attention. Hey, I was on this show. You know, this is what I was hoping you could do for me, and I'll, I'll come and I'll do panels and I'll sign autographs and blah blah blah. And you get rejected a lot because people the, the show hasn't sunk in yet. And meanwhile, echoing in my head is the fact that you only have six months to make something happen. If something doesn't happen in six months, you're forgotten. You know? And somehow I've been able to keep it going for the last three years, almost four years. So it's, it's, it's a testament to luck, but also a little bit of more prepared, uh, preparedness. But, um, and because I didn't write this necessarily as a means for like a how-to to go into, conventions when you guys meet like reality celebrities and stuff like that you have a little more of a background about what they've had to go through to get there you know so I don't believe any of them should have a chip on their shoulder because reality shows are, are like a luck of the draw kind of thing and yes they sometimes make us famous sometimes you just don't get much you know out of it but you know you're still a regular person and you're not an actor you don't do movies uh, well there's, there's, there's a little bit wrong there, but um, you, you should treat the people who watched you on that show with, a, with more respect than, say, the actor sitting next to you who starred in a movie. Not that that's okay that they treat people like crap, but, you know, you've got more of a personal connection with those people than somebody you watched in a superhero, right? Um, so, I mean, I talk about stuff like that in the book, and the, the things are... You know, there were reasons why the show never made a second uh, a second season. I kind of go into some of uh, the concepts in there in the book. Um, it's hard for us because 
on the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge, we broke all kinds of sci-fi records. And like we had like 15 million viewers, I'm told. You know, we had, you know, um, our first, uh, our premiere was like through the roof and the ratings. The second one, which is equally important, I don't know if you guys knew that, the second episode is almost more important than the first episode. Because the first episode, you draw attention. The second episode, you lock in your viewers. And then you sort of just keep them with the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You know, um, and this was our, our, our inaugural, you know, season. And we wouldn't be back for season two, but we were all sad, I think, to not see a season two. And there were so many things that played into, in, in, into that, and some of the contestants are a reason for that. You know, and it's sad because, you know, we didn't want to be one-hit wonders. But on the flip of the coin, there'll only ever be 10 of us that were on that show. And we were picked from a thousand people, you know, a thousand applicants, you know, and so when you think about the percentages there, you know, just being on the show was literally a win. And um, when we were on the show, you know, uh, as they whittled us down, you just kind of made that much more of an impact. The one thing you don't want to be on a reality show is the first one sent home. You know, it's like it's like the kiss of death because no one remembers the guy who was sent home first. You know, he didn't have it or she didn't have a chance to make themselves known in any way. The longer you're on the show, the more you build a character list up. And, you know, not a character list, I'm sorry, a fan base up. And it was weird that me swearing as much as I did, and I now am, um, I'm known as the, uh, as the most bleeped person on the Sci-Fi Network, because I just let it fly, you know, and I probably should have been nicer when I thought about how many children were watching, because my fan base is mostly you know, it's like teenage girls to, it's like 16 to like 21, and then, and then these 10 year olds, so seven to 10 year olds, you know, and I was like, oh my God, I would have been so much more well behaved had I known that there were these little kids watching the show. And I almost wish that I could get her permission. I might actually try. I mean, we still have a little bit. The book actually comes out in, at the end of January, so we're in pre-sale now. So if it's something that you guys are interested in and in, uh, doing, we're doing a limited run of the hardcover. They're each going to be numbered and things like that. We're going to personalize them, so when we send them to you, they'll be, you know, personalized. But we're selling them here at the con uh, for pre-order. Um, but there's this little kid in Iowa. I was telling you about him last night, and he was like 10 at the time. And I get this email, well, I was a Facebook message from his mom, and this kid is like mortified. I mean, you can tell that he was like, he's crying, and the picture she took is very unflattering of this poor kid. He's gonna be pissed when he becomes an adult, you know? But she sent this picture to me because he fell apart and lost his mind when I got eliminated. Like, I meant some, so much to this little kid who had never met me before that he would allow himself to become emotionally invested in my success on the show which meant so much, I can't even tell you. You know, I've got kids of my own, and they were like, ah, you know, you know, little bastard. Well, there goes your college fund, right? I'm gonna smoke it away, I'm gonna you know, drink it away, whatever, you know. Um, but this little kid was so invested that, that he fell apart, so I, I was like, I was honored by it. So I said, okay, I'm a special effects artist, all right? I, it was probably the wrong thing to send, but the kid loved it. I sent him a bunch of shrunken heads that I had made, you know, so that he had them with a, with a letter that I had written for him. And I took a picture of me holding the letter next to a bunch of creatures I had made. So he knew that I actually wrote the letter and it wasn't like one of my employees or something like that. And, you know, and I kind of keep in touch with him every now and again. I'll send him happy birthday messages and stuff. He's probably gotten to the point where, you know, once people meet me, it sucks because the whole fanfare is gone, you know, and if they watch the show, it's so much fun to have people come up and they're like speechless. And I never thought that would actually happen because it's just a reality show. Um, but my wife would be sitting, me at, sitting with me at a Comic Con and then like a girl would walk up and she couldn't form a sentence. And she was just like, and you could tell she was starting to hyperventilate. I was like, this is the best feeling in the entire world. Why can't you be more like that? You know? I mean, and she was just like, I don't understand. People were like, I would stand for like like 600 photo ops at a, at a con that I'd get up and I'd be taking my picture with these people. And my wife's just like, I don't understand why they want a photo with you. I just don't get it. And I'm like, I don't care. 
but I got like I was surrounded by really cute girls, you know, <laughs> and I'm like having a blast, you know, um, and little kids where it was just awesome. So I'm like getting down and I, I realized that my knees were going out because I'm constantly going to you know, kind of like these things with these kids and stuff. But so I mean, there's some there's some positives, but you know, they're, they're, the aftermath is worth it. But the, during the show, you were really questioning. Like I can't tell you how many times I almost walked out, and you can't walk out. It's not that you're under contract that you can't walk out. Do you guys remember an episode? I won't mention names, but if you're really hardcore fans of Face Off, um, there was an episode where one of the girls on the show, oh, sorry, one of the ladies on the show quit, right? And she had been fed up. Well, it turns out there was someone cheating on the show, and she was pissed off that the production wasn't going to do anything about it, and she felt that the show was rigged, so she quit. And you get a different story while you're watching the show itself. Um, and when she quit, she was getting death threats and she was being, you know, trolled. They have no idea why she quit. And they just knew that she quit and they could have been the person on the show. And because she took their spot, you know, then, you know, they, then, then she was the most hated person, you know, because if you weren't going to stick it out, why would you quit, you know? I mean, why would you even go? You know, um, because this is what they tell you. We had 40 people picked from a thousand people, and they whittled that 40 down to to 10. In that, for the, the the remaining 30, they told every one of those last 30 people that they were number 11, and they were going. You know, if anything happens, that they would be called. Or you know, you made you almost made it. You were number 11 on the list. And I actually met somebody who continues to introduce himself as the 11th cast member of the show, and we only had 10, and I finally got sick of hearing the guy so many times that I broke his heart and told him, dude, there are 30 number 11s on the show. They told everybody that, you know, I finally just, I kind of felt bad afterwards, but it shut him up, thank God, you know, but, um, so we, we were kind of worried that any time we could just be replaced, right? So if you quit, you know, that next person that was told that they were number 11 or in, in the case of, I think it was 15 on Face Off, that they were number 16, you know, if they were told that, then they were really hyper pissed off they missed out on being at the, on the show because that person who quit left. So she was getting death threats, all kinds of stuff. So, um, wow, I had a point to the whole thing and I completely lost track of my mind I went off on the side, but, you know, um, so you can't just leave the show if you want to. You got to stick it out. And I remember, I personally like wanted to leave a couple of times because of how rigged I felt the system was. You know, there were things that were going on that that felt that they weren't on the up and up. You know, but we couldn't prove any of it. And there were safety hazards like you wouldn't believe. Um, so if we take this down. So imagine this is the Henson stage, the sound stage, and right here is all of the um, uh, the camera equipment, the stage, everything. And in this section is the backstage, and right here is the stage itself. There's all the camera equipment where the judges were and stuff like that. Now there's this hallway, a narrow passage that comes through here. Now if we were important actors, you know, like the, the judges and stuff like that, we could just come from our dressing room straight onto the stage. But because of who we were, we came in right here and had to walk down this passage, this passage, and this passage. Okay. Um, in the dark and tripping over wires and cords and they had these big racks that held uh, the, uh, all the wire bundles and they had these posts that were coming out. And those posts like if you tripped and fell into it, you were gonna lose an eye, you were gonna get poked in the throat, something was gonna happen and somebody was gonna get hurt. And for the first like two episodes, we were walking down these dark corridors and there's somebody in front with a flashlight on their cell phone trying to keep track of the path for us. You know, there's 10 people on the line, maybe the first three people are gonna see where they're going, but the rest of us couldn't see. It was safety violations like you wouldn't believe, but we couldn't prove it because they took our cell phones away. So the guy with the cell phone was one of the casting people and he's trying to guide us as safely as possible around all this this, this maze of crap. Um, so the fact that they didn't give a damn about your safety was another factor. You know, I mean, that's how little you, you know, that they, they, they gave a damn. And, you know, I can't even express. Like that photo, I think pretty much says it all. You know, um, so when, when I was, 
when I was ready to leave the show, it was mainly because of the fact that I was like, you know, somebody's going to get hurt in this damn show's a death trap. Um, and I, you know, the day I, I announced I was going to quit and scared the hell out of the production um, was the second episode. And there were people ready to follow me for their own reasons. Like, um, one of the cast members had been brought to tears on the set of the first episode for something that he had no control over. Um, it wasn't even something that he and a teammate had done. It was something that I believe the production had set into place that um, that put somebody in physical danger, almost uh, life and death danger, and they were blamed for it. And so this guy's like in tears. He was ready to quit. His whole vision of the Henson Company was just completely destroyed that day. You know. Um, there was an, uh, another person who, 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 who just, he was trying to quit every episode so that he could look like, like he had a Jesus complex. He wanted to be someone's savior. So if you got eliminated, he was like, I'm gonna tell the producers that, you know, I'll go ahead and go home. So that it was his, it was his gimmick. It was his, what he was trying to do to make a name for himself. But um, little did he know that, you know, by quitting, he was gonna put himself in, in, in harm's way because he was gonna get the same death threats that that girl on Face Off, you know, uh, had to deal with um but i mean just so much and i was like ready to leave so many times but i didn't because i i knew at that point what it meant to leave and at that point you know i'd spent all this time dealing with this show and it's bullshit that i really want to give all this up you know but when i saw that 40 percent of the crew of the cast was ready to walk you know i was like if we walk the show's over because they can't afford. They've already put one episode in the can, actually two episodes in the can. There's no way they could afford to reshoot all of that by bringing in new staff. The show would go bankrupt and we would finally have a little bit more control. Things started to change a little bit at that point with the help of sci-fi. Because when the sci-fi network came in and started looking at things, they were like, aha, this is not what we wanted. You know, and they started to straighten things out. But um, there's just so much on a reality show that, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, I wish, I wish I could, you know, express, like, I wish there was a way to project your thoughts and your memories onto a wall, and you guys would be like, are you freaking kidding? Because we had no way to prove it. They took our phones. We couldn't communicate with the outside world. We couldn't, they wouldn't even allow us to have pens and paper because we weren't allowed to create unless it was on television, unless they were recording it. So you've got a bunch of artists, you've got 10 artists locked up in a house for two months, you know, and no creative outlet. Oh my God! It was like everyone was menstruating at the same time, you know, like a really bad one. You know, it was horrible. So, oh yeah, it was bad. Like there was no outlet. You couldn't watch television. There was no television. You couldn't watch. There was no art on the wall. There was no furniture. There was no carpeting. There was no curtains on the damn windows. You know. Um, the, the plumbing had problems. I mean, that cast house, there's a reason why it wasn't in the, on the show. It was like the most ghetto um, mansion I have ever heard of in my life, you know? And it was in a great neighborhood, you know? I mean, anyway, you know, it was, there was a lot of positives that could happen with the show, but when you get in there and the reality of things, uh, you know, is that you're gonna get treated like crap. Um, does anybody have any questions about, like, I mean, because I know a lot of reality show people now, so I might know someone from the show that you're interested in and, you know, might be able to kind of, you know, this is kind of a downer panel now that I think about it. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but, you know, there were some fun aspects. I, I gotta say, I'm oh, sorry, did you have a question? Oh, um, every, all the fun came after the show was over and I started doing cons. Cause the, because once you get away from the trolls, right, you know, the fans who loved the show were so hyper into the show that it made you feel like you had done something cool even though you knew the truth. <laughs> and, you know, you felt like you were part of, a, you know, like this really cool scene that, you know, that it was a limited group of people and there would only ever be 10 of us. And Face Off, I've lost count. I mean, Face Off, what, it's 15 people per episode. They're on episode, or sorry, season 20 now. And, you know, it, like there's always like there's probably like 300 people that have been on on the show except for that really tired recycling thing that they keep doing which we kind of hoped for you know it was like you know even after the show i remember thinking god it'd be great to be on like face off or something it's the same damn network you know it's a different group of producers so they had a little bit uh, better time 
but they're still treated like crap, you know, I mean, for the most part, you know, <laughs> it's just, but being a, a, a comeback person, you, you kind of like assume they're going to treat you a little bit better. But from what I've heard from my friends that are repeats on face off, they're like, no, it's the same. <laughs> it's, but um, we got to hear a lot of stuff about face off. Like, I probably should have brought this up last night in the WTF um, panel. Um, you know what? I can't even tell you. I tell you in the book, and I'm not just saying that to get you to buy the book, but there's an episode. <sighs> okay, there's an episode where an ambulance was called at, on Face Off. Do you guys remember that one? There's a, a, a model was down. We have a model's down, you know? I mean, so the guy passed out. There's a reason why he passed out. And it was because they were doing some body paint episode, right? Or that was the challenge for that particular episode. And the woman, oh, yeah, um, yeah, well, the woman who was working on him either knew what she was doing and was being really coy about it or had no clue and should have, but she was putting body paint in a certain area. And this man was kind of like fighting issues and finally passed out from the stress of the situation. And that's why he hit the ground. So he passed out from dehydration and that. And so that's why the ambulances were called. And everybody on set is watching this happen, but nobody knew what to say. They were like, I don't think she understands what's going on right now. Cause she just kept putting this red paint on. And I guess everybody was just like, there's like beads of sweat going out of everybody's face. I can't believe what's happening, right? <laughs> So we heard about that. We heard about like some of the. the we had this guy on set. Um, we I call him Gossip Guy in the book because he has worked on every episode of Face Off as their as their uh, cast uh, liaison, right? And he was on our show as well. And this guy would tell everybody's dirty little truths. Only he would tell us their names. Like I keep names out of it because of the fact that you know it's a funny story. But, you know, people, like, there was, there was circumstances behind these issues that prevented these people from realizing what they were doing, right? Like, maybe she was just really focused on getting that red paint coverage in that spot, you know? And this guy just couldn't handle it and freaking passed out, right? Um, there were episodes where, uh, but he was willing to tell us all what her name was, blah, blah, blah. There was some, there was some uh, romantic activities in the back of what we called the Yoda van. Um, it was, it, the Yoda van took us back and forth to the set because you're not allowed to do anything on your own on a reality show. They escort you back and forth, even if it's to go to the bathroom. And, and, and the lovely part of that is they announce the entire set on the radios and screaming as loud as they can. So-and-so has to make a pee-pee. So-and-so has to go to the bathroom. And everyone now knows what you're doing, right? It's like, you know, you never realized that a, a human, like a bodily function was that embarrassing until everyone that you work with and people that you've looked up to, like the, the, here, you got the Hensons over here, you got Gigi Edgeley over here, you got Kirk Thatcher. These are people that you're going to work with, and and is it going to be burned into their minds how many times you've had to pee in a day? Because now everybody knows because it's been broadcast. It's like embarrassing. You might not feel it, but imagine being marched through a group of people and being announced that you're going to the bathroom. And the reason why they do that was so everyone would leave the bathroom because you couldn't talk to anyone on the set. And if you, were, if you were coming through a part of the set that might have had some surprise element to it, you couldn't see it. So if they announce that you're going through and why you're going through, they could hide everything or steer you away. And if you happen to be in a urinal next to one of the, uh, one of the other guys and they happen to be talking to something, maybe, maybe they got their buddy next to them and they're talking about a setup that, they, that they're doing on, on the set, now you have some information that the other people don't have, so they have to clear out the bathroom so that you can go pee, blah, blah, blah. And it's just embarrassing, you know? <clears throat> um, so imagine all of that piling up and we were hearing for the first time that there was a guy who cracked under the pressure of all of that when he was brought up in the very first episode of one of the seasons and he ended up running off the stage. Do you guys remember that? Um, epi episode in uh, at, uh, Face Off. I don't want to say because the second I say what season it is, I'm going to inadvertently be telling you who it is. But they thought it was made up. They thought that this guy went running off the stage and they were chasing him down in the Yoda van, um, 
trying to uh, to catch him and that it was all staged, that he was actually running down the street, you know, for the hell of it. And that wasn't the case. They were trying to catch this guy so that he wouldn't hurt himself out on the street because he had been stressed to the point where he ran away. And apparently he came back to haunt them because now there's sort of, I think there's a, uh, there's a restraining order against him because he took it personally, the show, he took the show so personally that he's actually attacked members of the casting department right in front of their offices. You guys have seen Glee, right? You guys never saw the, the show Glee? Or the, yeah, where they used to hit, like it was a big thing to be slushy or something. Well, he hit this woman in the face with a slushy so hard that it like impacted into her sinuses. I mean, she'd be hospitalized. I mean, this guy went nuts, like straight up nuts. And so when we were on the show, they're like telling us, they're like, if you see this person, call us immediately because he's been banned from the set and he's a danger to himself and others. And we're like, what the hell? We don't even have curtains on our windows. We have no kind of security. And oh my God. So stuff like that that you see was kind of real, but you know, you have to, you have to know what was real and what wasn't. When I talk about stuff like that, the show starts to become a little more fun. Like the fact that our cast house was infested with uh, insects. Like, infested. <laughs> like, if you sat down for too long, you're like pulling out of your ears and stuff like that. It was bad. If you use the microwave and the coffee machine at the same, or the coffee pot at the same time, it would trick the breaker. If you cooked on the stove, the smoke, because it wasn't being evacuated, would set off an alarm system that I'm not kidding you would scream, Fire, fire, exit, exit. And we're all trying to like fan the smoke away from these smoke detectors because all we wanted was a damn egg, you know? And, and everybody had to open the windows and all this stuff. The heaters didn't work. So everybody's like, I mean, I know it's LA and it's, it's, it's the fall when we were shooting and it seems like it would be, you know, but 50 degrees, you know, and it starts dropping a little bit at night and it's blowing in the windows and stuff. There's no heat. To come. It was, it was getting bad. So we've all got these really pathetic blankets that they picked up at Ikea, I swear to God, on, on sale. Because, I mean, they weren't very thick. And our mattresses were like this thick. So we were laying in these bunk beds that looked like rickety craziness from some military horror movie. And, you know, and so you're freezing and, you know, the amenities, I can't even tell you. And I told these guys last night about, and, <laughs> about the bathroom. So the bathroom, the girl, the lady's uh, side of the house, you know, they had two bathrooms, right? And one of them had to had to use the restroom in in one re in one of the bathrooms while another one was showering in another restroom. And when she flushed the toilet, um, it backed up into the shower. So we heard. We heard one of the ladies screaming in the shower, and then we were like, what the hell? You know, it was like, we knew that there was no curtains on the windows. Is there a peeping Tom? And you know, and why didn't I know we could go over there and look? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I mean, so we didn't know why she was screaming, and then you open the door, and you're like, oh my God, you know? It smells so bad. And then here comes the contempt. She was like so mortified that it was now public. What she had done in the bathroom, and now someone else was sharing it. It was it was horrible because this place had been abandoned for years, and the plumbing had all these roots in it and stuff, and it was like, oh, and so it was coming up through the drain. They had to have a, a, like a plumber come out and pay like pay him like thousands of dollars to get this thing all these roots cleaned up and stuff, and it was oh, it was horrible. <laughs> they had to take this World War II style uh, um, heat. Uh, what is it, uh, hot water heater out of the men's side because we had no hot water for the first little while. And I swear to God, it looked like a section of an old submarine. I mean, I've never seen a water heater that looked like this. Oh my God. And then you had to share it. Oh, they, it was like a hundred, okay, it was like a hundred gallon, no, it was like a 50 gallon water heater. It was small. And there, are, there's essentially five guys taking showers. Like I would take a shower like in the middle of the night. I'd get up in the middle of the night and take a shower so I knew that there was hot water. But if you if we got up in the morning and you were a morning showering person, you were screwed. Cause if cause uh, the one kid on the show, Jake, liked to take like two hour showers and he'd get out and by the time the next person got in it was like literally cold, you know? And so everyone was trying to like 
you know, figure out their shower time. And then you had to share with five other guys a bathroom. And men are pigs, man. I'm the first to admit it. That bathroom was always the nastiest bathroom. And then they would trash that bathroom and then start using the women's bathroom on the other side. So you'd see guys running back and forth in their boxers or a robe. And the, and, and the ladies are just like, get the hell out. You know, this is our section. You're not going to taint our section with your nastiness. And yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, stuff like that was kind of funny when I think about it, because nothing really bad happened to me. I didn't end up with stuff on my feet, you know, in the, in the shower, but, oh, well, that's in the book. You know, there's even more stuff, you know, but, um, have you ever seen anything on the show that you were wondering if it was real or not? Because I might be able to figure that out, I mean, depending upon who I knew from the show, or I can make a phone call. I got my cell phone. Maybe we'll find out. You know? <laughs> so, we to I, I did too. I had never, ever watched one. So before I went on the show, I was like, essentially like, um, like mass consuming them so that I knew how I was supposed to, to act and stuff. Because before that, I had never seen Face Off. I had made fun of Face Off most of the time. Um, and I, yeah, and, and, and so I was watching that, Ink Masters, even RuPaul's Drag Race. And that was kind of lucky because our producers actually produced RuPaul's Drag Race and uh, Project Runway. So I was, the drama element was good to know so I knew when I was being set up for something because they had a tendency of doing that. You know, um, we had one uh, story producer that I named Satan and it stuck because she was like a chain smoker and literally you knew she was coming because the smoke would precede her, you know? <laughs> and it was like, oh shit, Satan's coming. And she was always like butt hurt that we didn't like her. She would use everything you said against you, but she'd come up in the morning, she's like, hey guys, how's it going? And no one would talk to you. We'd all just sort of turn our backs on her and stuff. And you know, and she was just like getting butt hurt that we didn't like her. It's like, there's a reason why we don't like you. You're the enemy, literally the enemy, you know? You're gonna turn everything we say, did you hear what Russ said about this? He's like, he said your work was crap. And I may never have said that, you know? I mean, story producers are the worst kind of evil, you know? They're, they're there to create drama that may not already exist. And, and that's their job. Their job is to be the worst kind of human beings. But, um, cool, it, oh, are we getting close to time? Yeah. So if you're interested in learning more about what kind of insanity you can deal with on a reality show, um, or you have a friend that's stupid enough that maybe they want to be on a reality show, this might be a good, you know, gift for them. You know, kind of a how-to of what the hell's wrong with you. You know, let me tell you a story about a guy I met. That's what you know. Honestly, take take some take some polls of your friends. Please send them to my website <laughs> so they can buy a copy of this damn book before I get sued and thrown in jail for probably something. You know, so um, I don't. I think it's in the Hearts um, Hearts Field. Does that any, does that sound familiar to you guys? The Hearts Field and downstairs. Um, hold on. No, I think it might actually be upstairs. Um, it's right across. So um, I think it's at four o'clock. I'm doing a panel. Does anyone have any interest in writing books? You know, and might want some insight into the publishing world and stuff like that? Because I'm doing a panel on nonfiction writing. It might also apply to fiction stuff, but it's actually geared towards, because I write a lot of nonfiction. I, I write how-to books for special effects and things like that. Um, and I try to steer people away from certain mistakes if they're trying to get something published, even like a comic book or something. There's a lot of pitfalls in that particular industry that I try to steer people away from uh, things like uh, we were I don't know if we were talking about this last night but like why not why to avoid Kindle you know as, a, as an author you know lots of reasons to avoid Kindle um, um, stuff like that but anyway I'll have that panel going on um, at four o'clock um, and I'll have my other books out in case you guys are interested in like perusing them and stuff um, yeah so hopefully you know that one I won't have, I'll still have some stories, but they'll be literary based, you know, so. Are you talking about the schedule of 4.30? Is it 4.30? That's what it says on here. Maybe you're right okay. it's just the wrong friend. Okay. No, no, it's probably right. I, I am notorious for having the wrong information. Parksville, uh, little, uh, non fiction writing, the four thirty to 
Yeah. 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 So, I mean, if you're interested or you think you might someday be interested, you know, let me know. It's not that hard. I mean, like, I hate to say that, you know, because, you know, I, I do make a good portion of my living from my books. So, but it's not really that bad, especially if you know what to avoid. So if you guys are interested in any of that, you know, come back and check me out. I will be at my booth for the next little while. And I also do creature design. Um, if you guys, that's what I actually do for a living is creature design. I'm a special effects artist. I make all kinds of creatures for things like I've worked on Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3, 50 First Dates, you know, uh, a couple of Danny Trejo movies. <laughs> I love Danny Trejo movies because he's the funniest cat on the set. But, um, uh, you know stuff like that so if you have like ideas for costumes or something or you have like a question you said you missed our creature design thing if you have a question about creature design come by my table and, and you know and I'll you know let you know you know what I can whatever I can if I can help you out I just helped this uh, lady this morning she was trying to figure out how to do some puppetry because um, you know a lot of creatures are puppeted even if it's animatronics it's still considered puppeted you know um, and it was just a simple mech that she was making way too complicated when I showed her how to do it you can just see the stress just leave her, you know? <laughs> so that felt good, you know? So anything you guys want to ask me or something, you know, come over to the, the table and say hello, you know? Is that your table with the dealers thing? It is, okay. yeah. Um, I'm with the other honored, there's two other honored guests, so I'm kind of like right right there with them, so. Yeah, Latin Vixen is, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, Remy's between us, so. If you guys get a chance, come over and say hi. Love talking about what I do, so. Uh oh, and there, there's the man who has control of my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's a, that's not me. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you guys so much for coming. And again, <laughs> if you run into anyone who's dumb enough to be on a reality show, have them buy my book. Or better yet, buy it for them. I don't care as long as I get the money. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because you know I make a whole 25 cents off of each copy, so. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the publishers are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I will teach you about in the nonfiction writing panel. So, 